Since we had our tech issues the other day, we're going to start right from the start with our asset and base discussion in case you missed anything with, with our problems. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about assets and bases, and we're really going to talk about them in our usual what's in it for us way. So we'll come to that in a minute. You'll see what I'm talking about there. So when you're in general chemistry, you looked at different definitions of an acid, acid or a base, or really an acid. You had your Lewis definition, you had your Bronsted definition, and you might have done some others. We're going to use the Lewis definition. And really what that's about is donating and accepting electrons. You're going to notice the donating and accepting electron idea is a common theme through a lot of what we're going to do in this class. So the first thing we're going to talk about is strong acids and strong bases and what makes them strong. What makes them strong, strong by definition, is that they're 100% ionized or 100% dissociated in water. So for example, let's say we're talking about hydrochloric acid. We write it HCl, and that's just how we write it. Making it easy to forget, it's actually hydrogen ions floating around in water and chloride ions floating around in water. They're not floating around stuck together the way we would imply it when we do write that HCl for hydrochloric acid. Sulfuric acid, same idea, nitric acid, and so on. Those are the ones that when you were in general chemistry in the lab, you get chased into the fume hood with them because they do dissociate completely. On the other hand, you had acids like acetic acid, basically vinegar. No one cared what you did with that. Um, it's a weak acid, not going to dissociate completely, so not as big of an, an issue. So 100% ionized or 100% dissociated in water. So really I should have been saying H3O plus and the chloride ion. The point though is that it's not staying stuck together as HCl. Weaker acids of course partially dissociate but not completely dissociate. Okay, let's talk about equilibrium constants. We're going to go to acid-base dissociation constants. We're going to focus more on acid dissociation constants, but let's talk about it. And this is where I know our tech issues started getting really bad. So an equilibrium constant is the concentration of the products over the concentration of the reactants. So products over reactants, which is pretty common. I'm using the square brackets for concentration, which specifically means molar concentration. We're not going to do numbers. We're not going to do calculations. So it really doesn't matter. But it's convenient to just designate our concentrations with the square brackets. So let's look at what we have going on. And this is where we start talking about your approach, your approach to learning this material. You can memorize it. You'll memorize it quickly, you know, regurgitate it probably quickly as well. And it's a quick answer. However, here's your, your problem. We're going to do this material now. And I know I've said this a hundred times, but it's worth repeating. You're going to put it away until fifth quarter. You're going to do other things in the meantime. You're going to do neuro. You're going to do biomechanics. You're going to do all that other stuff. You're going to have lots of chances to forget it. All good intentions. I know you think you're going to review it, but you're going to be too busy with the other stuff to do that. So the more you can get in the understanding category, the better. That's the stuff that you're going to keep in your head. So... I'm going to take the time to do this now so that you'll understand it. Then, like I said, that'll keep it in your head. We're going to pause for one second. Sorry. So 
sorry about that. I adopted a 40-year-old parrot a few months ago, and she was taken off going rogue in the house. Anyway, if I learn how to edit between now and tomorrow morning, I'll edit that out. So if you're hearing it, I didn't learn how to edit overnight. So anyway, um, our equilibrium constant is products over reactants. So let's look at what our reaction is. We have whatever reactants going to products. So whatever our reactants are, they are, and the purpose of the reaction is to convert those to the products. So if our K, our equilibrium constant, is the concentration of the products over the reactants, let's look at what's going on. So let's say one case I have lots of products made, so I made lots of products. Lots of product, I guess. So what I'm actually saying is not much reactant left. So in that case, my K, which don't forget is products over reactants, is going to be a big number because I have lots of product over a small number because I don't have much reactant left. So big number over a small number is going to be a big number. So what that means then is a big K, big equilibrium constant means I have lots of reaction progress. That's the term or the way you're going to see it. Lots of reaction progress. I made lots of product is another way of saying it. Or let's do it the other way around then. So let's say now this is my case B or whatever. I didn't make much product. So if I didn't make much product, that means I have lots of reactant left. The reaction didn't do much. It progressed a little. So it progressed a little. So now my K, which is still products over reactants, is going to be the little number because that's the concentration of my products. I don't have much product. The reaction didn't do very much over the concentration of my reactants. I still have lots of reactant because the reaction didn't do much. So that's going to be my big number. If I divide a small number by a big number, that's going to give me a small number. So if I have a small k, that means that I have little reaction progress. The reaction didn't do much, so I didn't make much progress in that, in that reaction. Another way of saying it is when I have that big K, that means I'm favoring, favor, favoring the product, favors the products, or that means the reaction has gone more to the products, not a lot of reactant left. Small k means I'm favoring, or it favors, the reactants. I have more reactants left, not much product. So small k favors the reactants, big k favors the products. And that's what I mean. You could memorize that. But here's the thing. As you know with memorization, the hardest memorization to do is that either or kind. Oh, big K favors the products, or does it favor the reactants? Give me 10 seconds to think about it, and I'll completely mess it up kind of thing. So all you have to remember, K is products over reactants. Plug it in. Which one's the big number? Which one's the small number? Does it give me big or small? That'll take you right to what a big K or a small K means. Then... When we come here, rather than memorizing this, rather than, 
Oops. Rather than memorizing this, you can just reason your way through it. An awful lot easier than, than trying to memorize it. So then, let's look at something. Next thing is Le Chatelier's principle. And that was one of the things we said is really, really important for you to know and be comfortable with because so, so much of what we're going to do in the rest of the course, both this quarter and next, relies on Le Chatelier's principle. What Le Chatelier said is that if I have a system that's in equilibrium and I do something to mess up that equilibrium, the system will adjust to restore it. Really, really important. I'm always going towards equilibrium. The whole world is going towards equilibrium. Not all equilibriums are good equilibriums. So keep that in mind because sometimes you're bothered when you're looking at, well, what's happening here? Well, if I go to equilibrium, that's a bad thing. You know, it's not a, it's a bad equilibrium. You'll think, well, no, that can't be happening. Yes, it can. You just might not stay there or get there. Something else in your physiology or your biochemistry will kick in and keep you from going to that bad equilibrium. Or you'll go to the bad equilibrium and then go to a new, better equilibrium. So we're always moving towards equilibrium. So there's a couple of things that can affect equilibrium. One of them is temperature. And that's the one we're going to not really talk about much after right now. But it's the one that can, it can mess you up because we won't talk about it. But temperature does affect equilibrium. Think about you have a coffee that you just got and you took a mouthful of it and it was not very sweet. So you knew you had to put more sugar in. You let it sit around for a while and kind of forgot through the sugar in. Then took a big mouthful of it. And what did you get? You got a mouthful of what felt like sand because there was that sugar and cold coffee. Well, you thought, that's okay, no problem. I'll throw the coffee in the microwave for a minute and I'm good. So what did you do? You put that sugar in cold coffee. So it, you established one equilibrium, the equilibrium in which the sugar stayed in a solid form. Didn't help you with the flavor of the coffee. So what did you do? You put it in the microwave, you changed the temperature, that allowed the sugar to go to its liquid form and get distributed through the coffee. So a whole different equilibrium where it's mixed in with the liquid coffee versus you know grainy sugar sitting at the bottom of your coffee cup. So that's changing temperature. We're gonna assume constant temperature. We're assuming body temperature throughout the course. We're assuming atmospheric pressure. After today, we're going to assume that we're at constant pH. We're going to get into buffering very shortly. When we buffer, we can assume constant pH. So the other way I can change my equilibrium is I can change the concentration of my products or reactants. That's what we're going to be doing. So that one gets really important. So let's say I have a reversible reaction. A can go to B. So A can go to B or B can go to A. So I'm going to start out with this system in equilibrium. I'm in equilibrium between A and B, 50-50, whatever that is. But now I go and dump in a bunch more A, whatever A is. So now I'm out of equilibrium. But what Le Chatelier says will happen is this. I'm going to take some of that A, make more B, so my concentration of B will go up and establish a new equilibrium in which I have more of both. Or, let's say instead, I'm in equilibrium. I have my A and my B in equilibrium. Now let's say I took some A out of there. I sent it into a different reaction, so I lowered my concentration of A. Oh, what's going to happen? Well, Le Chatelier says that that'll make the reaction go towards A. Some B will get converted to A and give me less of both. Or, here's another one. I'm in equilibrium. I've got equal amounts of A and B. Let's say all of a sudden I dump more B in. I'm out of equilibrium. So what's going to happen? 
Le Chatelier says, I'll take some of the B, make some A. So now I have more of both again. I'm in a new equilibrium with more of both. Or what else? Let's say, let's say I'm in equilibrium, but I take some A away. Did we do this one already? I take some A away. If I do that, some B will go to replace A less of both. Maybe I didn't take B away. If I took B away, some A will go over and less of both. So either way, whether I add or take away, I'm going to readjust to get in a new equilibrium that's either more of both or less of both. Really, really important that you're comfortable with Le Chatelier's principle because we're going to have lots of reversible reactions. And for you to figure out what's going on with that reversible reaction, you're going to have to think about Le Chatelier's principle and that if I do something to mess up an equilibrium, as in add or take away product or reactant, I'm going to readjust, establish a new equilibrium with more of both or less of both, depending on whether I added or took away. Okay, so we're going to derive, and we did this very quickly in class, we're going to kind of derive the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So let's look at what's going on, and I'll kind of set you up for it, and you can go through it. So we said that K, our equilibrium constant, is the concentration of the products over the concentration of reactants. And we have reactants going to products. So let's apply this to an acid dissociating in water. I'm going to write my acid as HA because the bismuth end of my molecule, the part that changes my pH, is the hydrogen ion. Then the rest of the molecule, in a way, is kind of along for the ride. So depending on what my acid is, it'll dissociate to varying degrees from very little up to 100% in water. So if I want to write my equilibrium constant for that, I can do that. My equilibrium constant is the concentration of my products. And again, I'm using my square brackets because we're not doing numbers over the concentration of my reactants. So let's back up and look at this for a second. We said that if I have a higher K, I have more products. Look at one of my, what one of my products is. It's the hydrogen ion, right? So if I have a higher K, I have more products. I'm more dissociated. Lower K, less product, less dissociated. Higher K, more hydrogen ion. Lower K, less hydrogen ion. Now let's bring another equation in. Remember our equation for pH. It's right here. I know you did it in general chemistry. pH is the negative log of the molar hydrogen ion concentration. So what I can do is I can take this equilibrium constant equation. I can rearrange it, solve it for the concentration of the hydrogen ion, and plug it in here. I give you everything you need to do that in here and you're welcome to do it. I won't I won't take the time and do it now. The only thing I don't give you is your logarithmic math if you don't remember it. Like log of xy is the log of x plus the log of y or the log of x over y is the log of x minus the log of y. I know I'm giving some of you guys college algebra PTSD right now. But I also don't want to just throw something out there and say take my word for it. I want to give you the information to go through it, prove it to yourself. But we're going to do it conceptually. So if you feel the need and want to do this and need my help, I'm happy to go through the whole derivation with you. But we're going to look at it for now conceptually. So if you agree with me, 
that my equilibrium constant is dependent on that hydrogen ion. I can rearrange the equation for my equilibrium constant and solve for the hydrogen ion and plug it in here. Does it make sense that pH is a function of your equilibrium constant or saying the same thing another way, pH is a function of how much I dissociate. So pH is a function of how much hydrogen ion I produce by dissociating the acid. So if that conceptually doesn't make sense right now, go through the steps. And what you're going to find, or what you're going to get to, is what's called the Henderson and Hasselbach equation. Basically, what you're going to derive, find, get to. Where's my gator blue? Is this. So the pH is a function of how much I dissociate, how much of a concentration of hydrogen ions I get. So remember, pH was the negative log of the molar hydrogen ion concentration. More hydrogen ion I get, more effect I have on pH. Again, remembering, and I know you guys think I'm losing my mind when I remind you guys of this, but I've seen the questions your predecessors have gotten wrong, the mistakes they've made. Don't forget, when hydrogen ion increases, pH decreases. When hydrogen ion decreases, pH increases because the logarithmic function is an inverse function. Okay, so why do we care? Why are we doing this? Well, here's why we care. Here's why we're doing this. You need to keep your pH at a neutral number. You need to keep the pH in your cells and tissues between 7.3 and 7.4. So we're always doing stuff whether it's reactions and processes in our cells and tissues or eating stuff or whatever, we're always doing stuff that changes our pH. So what do we do about that? What we do about that is this, we buffer. We have buffers. We have molecules that can act as an acid or a base and bring our pH back to that neutral number that we need. So a buffer solution is a weak acid or a weak base and the salt of the weak acid or the weak base, the conjugate, you've learned all that. Here's a very simplistic mechanistic definition of a buffer, but it works. It's a molecule that can give me a hydrogen ion if I need it or tie up hydrogen ions if I don't need them. So let's talk about that. So let's say I have, I have a beaker and your blood is in my beaker. So we'll make it red. And you have a certain number of hydrogen ions in there floating around and you have exactly the right number that keeps your pH where you need it, 7.35 to 7.45. So you're happy you have your pH right where you need it. Then you do something. You do, I don't know, some metabolic process or whatever. And all of a sudden you make these extra hydrogen ions. So you have these extra hydrogen ions floating around in there. Well, let's think about what our pH is. pH is the negative log of the molar hydrogen ion concentration pH is the negative log of the concentration of hydrogen ions floating around, not attached to anything. They're attached to something. They're not free hydrogen ions anymore. So what I'm going to do now, I have too many of these things from whatever I did. That's increasing my hydrogen ion concentration, which of course, as you know, is decreasing my pH. It's too low. So what am I going to do? I'm going to throw my buffer in. So I'll put my buffer in. 
my buffer is a molecule that can tie up some of these. So what my buffer will do is attach to some of them, attach to some of them, attach to some of them. So now I've attached my buffer to this one, to this one. So what have I done? What I've done is I've taken these guys out of the count that makes up my hydrogen ion concentration. They're not hydrogen ions floating around on their own anymore. So I've gotten my concentration of hydrogen ions back down. I've gotten my pH back up, all based on Le Chatelier and equilibrium. So the other thing we can do, we can tell the story another way. Let's say now my pH is too high. I don't have enough hydrogen ions. So now what I can do is I can throw some buffer in, throw buffer in again. So again, a buffer is a molecule that can give me hydrogens if I need them, tie them up if I don't need them, all equilibrium dependent. So now, since I don't have enough of these floating around, I throw my buffer in and it dissociates. So this becomes a free hydrogen ion. There's another. Dissociates. This one becomes a hydrogen ion. Dissociates. Becomes a hydrogen ion. Put another one down here. Dissociates. So this becomes a hydrogen ion. So now I have another hydrogen ion. Another. 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 I've gotten my count back up. So now what I just did was increase my hydrogen ion concentration to bring my pH back down. Again, how? Based on what? Le Chatelier, equilibrium. I didn't have enough hydrogens, made the buffer dissociate and give me some. If I have too many, it'll make the buffer grab onto the hydrogen ion, get them out of the solution, just depending on what your equilibrium is. So that's how my buffers work. Now, why do we care? Why are we buffering? You know, who cares? Well, you do, and here's why you care. You have all kinds of reactions, all kinds of processes, all kinds of things going on in your cells. You can only have the ones you need working and working properly if you stay at this neutral pH. You're constantly doing things that push you away from the neutral pH. So we've got a buffer to keep bringing you back to the pH where things work properly. The other thing is, let's keep in mind just quick, our pH equation is the negative log of the molar hydrogen ion concentration. We want our pH between 7.3 to 7.4. When I just look at that, that 7.3 to 7.4, it looks like a very narrow range. But don't forget, even you guys who never want to see college algebra or a log function again, don't forget what a log function is. It's an exponential function, remember 10 to the power of and all that. So when you go back to that and put that in perspective, you realize this range isn't quite as narrow as, as it looks on first, first impression. Okay, so how am I buffering? I'm gonna buffer by tying up my extra acid, tying up my extra base and getting rid of it. So it's all equilibrium based, all based on the equilibrium constant, no coincidence there, and I'll use the buffer. So what I'll try to do, or what I'll do, is tie up the extra acid or base and one way or another get it, get it out of the cell, out of the tissue. Water is a pretty lousy buffer, kind of makes sense. We have equal amounts of acid and base, hydroxyl and hydrogen in water. Okay, let's talk about human buffering systems. So we have different systems in us, in our cells, in our tissues that buffer, depending on where you are, what tissue, different ones act there.
So what we're trying to do is we're trying to stay in this 7.35 to 7.45 range. If we get too far out of, out of that, it can be fatal. So it's really important that we stay in it. If we go below 7.35, we get a condition called acidosis. Go above 7.45, we get a condition called alkalosis with two alkalines. So we'll talk about that. So we're going to talk about three homeostatic regulators of pH. We're going to talk about them in the context of two things. One, how fast they are. The other, how per permanent they are. And that's the only categories we're going to put them in. The buffers we're going to talk about can fall into more than one of these categories. So these are some of the buffers we're going to talk about, and that's all fine. But as far as trying to categorize them with these three regulatory systems, what you're going to find is that they fall into more than one. So the first regulator we're going to talk about is that of chemical buffering systems. So chemical buffering systems are fast. They're going to be the first one to respond, usually in the order of seconds. So what they do is they temporarily kind of tie up the extra acid or base, but here's how they do it. They do it based on equilibrium. So they get you to a new equilibrium that takes the extra acid, extra base out of the way, the solution, whatever the solution might be, your blood, your cellular fluids, whatever. But where it's equilibrium based, it doesn't take much to get a new equilibrium. So you get a new equilibrium and you kind of undo, can undo the buffering. So this is the fastest and this is the least permanent. Okay, so then let's go all the way to the other end. Oh, well, we, well, we can go in order. The second one is your respiratory mechanisms. They're kind of quick to respond, not as quick as chemical, but they usually respond in the order of minutes. They're a little equilibrium based or have some, some effect from equilibrium. So they're not all that permanent, but if I can exhale something out that alters my equilibrium, and keeps me from going back, that gives, gives me some permanence. So we'll, we'll talk about that, and we'll talk about how carbon dioxide plays into everything. So this is my in-between, both in terms of speed and, and permanence. The next one we're going to talk about, and the last one, is your kidneys, renal mechanisms. So here's how it works with your kidneys. If we could get the extra acid or the extra base to the kidneys and incorporate it in the urine, we get rid of the urine, so that's permanent. So this is the one, the most permanent. Whatever we can get into the urine, it's gone. So we have the permanence there. However, it takes a little while to get extra acid or extra base in the kidneys to get to the urine, so it's the slowest one. So my chemical is the fastest, least permanent. My kidneys, renal, is my slowest, or my slowest is, I guess, my slowest, um, but the most permanent. Okay, so let's talk about the individual buffering systems. So the first one we're going to talk about is your phosphate buffering system or phosphoric acid. So there's a couple different ways. This is more of a circular way of going through it. And I'm going to go through it in a very linear manner. And whichever one you like, you're more than welcome to use. Okay, so let's look at the formula of phosphoric acid. It's H3333PO4. 3, 3, 3, PO4. So H3PO4. So when I take my phosphoric acid and I put it in water, it's going to dissociate. First step of my dissociation is to the hydrogen ion and dihydrogen phosphate. Cool, got a hydrogen ion. Dihydrogen phosphate, not so sure I'm excited about that. Well, kind of. Let's take the dihydrogen phosphate now. 
I can dissociate it into another hydrogen ion and hydrogen phosphate. Oh, that should have been just a minus up there, sorry. So there's my two minus. So now I have hydrogen phosphate. I can take that now, dissociate it to another hydrogen ion, plain old phosphate. So you could draw it this way, or you could draw it in one big line from H3, PO4, to plain old PO4, because what do I have in the middle? I have those three hydrogen ions. So here's how this buffer works. If I'm all the way down to a PO4, to a phosphate, I can potentially tie up three hydrogen ions, depending on my equilibrium, on my way to going back to H3PO4. Or other way around, if I'm at H3PO4, depending on my equilibrium, excuse me, I'm sorry, depending on my equilibrium, I could potentially get three hydrogen ions freed up to go in solution on my way down to just the phosphate. So that's three hydrogen ions that I can put in my, in my solution. So I've got this big equilibrium from end to end where depending on where I am, potentially I can get three hydrogen ions if I need them, or I can get rid of three hydrogen ions when I need them. So when you get to particularly quarter four, when Dr. Gonzalez is talking about your kidneys and stuff like that, She's going to mention phosphoric acid, phosphates, things like that. And she'll talk about how they're buffering in the kidney. Your job is going to be to go back and think about this and say, oh yeah, H3PO4. I can potentially get three hydrogen ions on my way to just a plain phosphate, or if I'm down to a phosphate, I can potentially tie up three hydrogen ions on my way back to H3PO4. And I know I'm saying it in kind of a goofy way, phosphoric acid, but I want to emphasize I have these three hydrogen ions that, depending on the equilibrium, depending on Le Chatelier, I can shift somewhere in between. In your notes, you may choose to write my three lines here is one long line going from your phosphoric acid, going through all your steps, all the way down to the phosphate. And it makes it more clear that you're just going back and forth in the equilibrium, depending on whether you need hydrogen ions or need to get rid of hydrogen ions. Okay, the next one is the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffering system. So actually what we're going to do, we're going to go to amino acids first because it's a little quicker, then come back to this and really just draw our way through the rest of the PowerPoint. It's very similar to another video I have on Brightspace that just does the bicarbonate and carbonic acid, but it was when we started online and I couldn't draw on online. Okay, so carbonic acid bicarbonate, we'll come back to it. Let's go to amino acids. Okay, so proteins are made up of amino acids. So let's talk about the structure a little bit. And I know a lot of this is just ancient history to some of you, but I also know chemistry's been a while for some of you. So we're gonna break down the structure of an amino acid. So if I'm properly completely drawing my amino acid, I'm gonna have a carbon with an R group, an R group is kind of like the X in math. It's the variable. 
So it could be anything. Well, not quite anything, but it could be different things. Could be a little hydrogen, could be a methyl group, ethyl group, whatever. And depending on what it is, that determines what amino acid you have. So also for an amino acid, we have a carboxylic acid end. Carbon double bonded to one oxygen, single bonded to another, which is single bonded to a hydrogen. If I'm drawing properly, I'd have my oxygen and my hydrogen. But of course, we're really good at just going OH like that. Then on the other end, I have an amino group. I have a nitrogen and a couple of hydrogens. But here's the thing. We get lazy about drawing this and, and we just do. We're just, we just do. So the way we often draw it is this. We'll do the carbon with the R group with the hydrogen and we'll go COOH on this end. We'll go NH2 on this end and draw our bond. And there's so many implications in here that are just not correct. If you look at this, you would think, all right, the oxygen, oxygens are attached to each other. No, they're not. If you look over here, no, they're not. You know, we left off that bond between the oxygen and the hydrogen. Here, it looks like the hydrogens are attached to the carbon. No, the nitrogen's attached to the carbon and the hydrogens are bonded to the nitrogen. So we will write it like this, even though we should be doing this. So be okay, be comfortable with that. So let's look at how an amino acid buffers. So we said everything's equilibrium based. So let's do first, let's say I have too many hydrogen ions. So too many hydrogen ions are what in pH? So too many hydrogen ions means my pH is too low. So I have lots of hydrogen ions floating around in solution. So what I'm going to do is this. Oops. On my amino end, I can attach another hydrogen. So equilibrium based, I'll put another hydrogen on here. Gets it out of solution, gets it out of the count, gets it out of the count that is my pH. So if I have too many hydrogens, I'll attach another one here. Or the other way around, I have too few hydrogens in solution. So what do I mean by that? I mean my pH is too high, I'm too alkaline, I'm too basic. So what will I do? Leave my amino end alone. Now I can take that hydrogen off of the carboxylic acid end. So I'll take it off and I'll leave my COO minus. So I might write it that way or I might just go like that. But when I do this, I really mean the oxygens are both attached to the carbon and not touching each other. So be a little careful when you see the COOH thing. You know, we, we don't mean those two, are, those two oxygens are bonded to each other. So now what have I done? What I've done is I've gotten myself another hydrogen ion to go floating around in solution. So again, all equilibrium based, whether I'm attaching a hydrogen to the amino acid, getting it out of solution, out of the count that is the pH, as in the negative log of the molar hydrogen ion concentration, or freeing one up because I don't have enough of them to be in the count that is the molar hydrogen ion concentration. So depending on the equilibrium, I can go either way. Okay, so now let's talk about carbonic acid and bicarbonate. And I'm just going to draw and finish the PowerPoint drawing. So the formula, the chemical formula for carbonic acid 
is H2CO3. And it can dissociate a couple different ways. It can dissociate into the hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion, or it can dissociate into carbon dioxide and water. So a couple things. When we're doing this in class and I'm asking you questions, I always tell you, you cannot say right or left. And I do it for two reasons. One is I just so happen to put water and carbon dioxide on the left. I just so happen to put the hydrogen on the right. Could go either way. So I don't want you thinking pH goes up, I go right, I go left, whatever. The other thing is we're going to talk about the kinetics of oxygen binding on hemoglobin. That is a topic where you have a graph, and we'll talk about the graph, and we'll draw it, and you'll learn it, and all that. But everybody will ask you questions on it. Are you shifting to the right or the left on this graph? But they won't give you the graph when they're asking you that. They'll just give you a set of conditions and say you're shifting to the right or shifting to the left. Changes in pH are one of those conditions. So I don't want you, as we're talking about changes in pH here, to mix up that right-left thing when right and left have nothing to do with this. This is all equilibrium-based. Okay, so what we're going to do is this. We're going to talk about acidosis and alkalosis. So here's how we're going to do that. We're going to go through some different scenarios. They're all in the back of the PowerPoint. And they all have things like hydrogen ion goes up, CO2 goes up, up, down, up, down, on all these arrows. Again, it's something you can memorize and make your life difficult or reason your way through and make your life easy. So first one we're going to say, actually, we'll just tell a story. We'll do biochem stories. So we're going to focus, though, on two things. We're going to focus on carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions. We're going to assume bicarbonates along for the ride, water is along for the ride. So my hydrogen ion concentration goes up. I've got bicarb there. I can shift my equilibrium towards the water and carbon dioxide side and make water and carbon dioxide. Or if carbon dioxide goes up, I'll have water somewhere that can meet my carbon dioxide and shift my equilibrium towards making more hydrogen and bicarbonate. So we can almost kind of ignore this part in the middle. Actually, let's do it this way. And we'll just put longer arrows in there. So this is no different than my A going to B thing that I did. So we said if I'm in equilibrium, I have equal, equal A and B. If A goes up, my equilibrium shifts to B, and B goes up. So I have more of both. A goes down. My equilibrium shifts towards A, making B go down, less of both. B goes up, I shift my equilibrium towards B. I'm sorry. B goes up, I shift my equilibrium towards A, more of both. Which one didn't I do? I always forget what the fourth one is. I guess B goes down. I shift my equilibrium towards B, making both A and B go down. So they both go up or they both go down um, because they just shift whichever direction they need to go to get back into equilibrium, depending on whether I added A, took away A, added B, or took away B. So you're going to see the same thing here. Depending on whether I add carbon dioxide, that gives me more hydrogen or add hydrogen, making me get more carbon dioxide, take away carbon dioxide, making hydrogen shift over and decrease to replace some, less of both, or take away hydrogen, making CO2 shift over to replace some hydrogen, and less of both. 
So they go up together or they go down together. So we're going to talk about four stories, scenarios, whatever. So we're going to have first one, and I usually do this in stories. So let's do the first one. Let's say I'm an emphysema patient. So the first one, I have a lung condition. And that's going to get important later. I have a lung condition and it's preventing me, I don't expect you to know anything about emphysema, preventing me from getting rid of, hydro, of carbon dioxide. So what do I do? If everything's working properly, I inhale my oxygen. This is the way I'm designed to do my stuff. I inhale my oxygen. I use my oxygen for all my processes, all my reactions, all my stuff, and make carbon dioxide. Then I exhale my carbon dioxide, get rid of it, and I'm good. That's the way I work. So here's what's going on with my lung condition patient. My lung condition patient, I'm using emphysema just because it's an easy one where you haven't covered lung conditions yet. So what happens with emphysema? Let's say I smoked, I'm an old guy and I smoked for 60 years. So what happens? Oh, what happens is this, I get my lungs so scarred up with scar tissue and everything, they lose their elasticity. So I'm not able to squeeze my lungs and force that carbon dioxide out. So I'm keeping it and it's building up. So because I can't get rid of my carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide is increasing. So when carbon dioxide increases, what happens? Well, I find myself some water, combines with the carbon dioxide, shifts me over to the hydrogen ion side, making my hydrogen ion increase. So hydrogen ion increases. If hydrogen ion increases, my pH decreases. This is where we get stuff up, down, up, down, and really easy to lose track of where you are. So hydrogen ion increases, pH decreases. So I'm getting acidic. pH goes down, it's acid, acidic. pH goes up, it's basic, alkaline. Um, yeah. So anyway, I'm getting acidic. So we're going to have four things you've got to figure out, or kind of, you put the pieces together. Now let's do another slide with that. So the four conditions we're going to look at are this. You're going to have respiratory alkal or respiratory acidosis. you can have respiratory alkalosis. You can have metabolic acidosis. You can have metabolic alkalosis. As you might have guessed, acidosis is what happens when I get too acidic. My pH goes down, so it goes down too far, too many hydrogen ions, pH too low. Alkalosis is what I get when my pH goes too high. I have too few hydrogen ions. If I get there in a respiratory manner, something not working properly with my breathing, that's my respiratory. If I get there from something I ingest, expel um, reactions in me that produce extra acid or extra base, then that's going to be a, me a metabolic mechanism. So let's go back. I got to acidic. So this is my acidosis. My problem was a lung condition. So this is my respiratory acidosis. So if you go to the slides at the end of the PowerPoint, you're going to find, find this. 
you're going to find what causes respiratory acidosis. Carbon dioxide goes up, hydrogen goes up, pH goes down, I get acidic. You can memorize all that or you can reason through it the way we just did. We said I can't get rid of carbon dioxide because of this lung problem I have. That's going to make my carbon dioxide increase. Because my carbon dioxide increases, I shift my equilibrium towards hydrogen, making my hydrogen ion concentration increase. So there's my CO2 going up. There's my hydrogen going up. There's my pH going down. There's my acidity, my acidosis. Problem was a lung condition. There's respiratory. Okay, Sue, so let's do another one. This time, we'll rewrite the equation. We've got water and carbon dioxide. We have hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. And of course, we're going to focus on the carbon dioxide and the hydrogen ion. Okay, so this time we're going to say that I'm hyperventilating. So if I'm hyperventilating, what am I doing? I'm breathing too much. My respiration rate has come up higher than it should be. So I'm breathing too much. So what that means is I'm exhaling more carbon dioxide than I should be. So I'm exhaling more carbon dioxide than I should be. So what's going to happen? What's going to happen is my carbon dioxide concentration is going to decrease. So that's going to cause my reaction, my equilibrium, or yeah, I guess my reaction to shift towards carbon dioxide to get back in equilibrium, making my hydrogen ion concentration decrease. Hydrogen ion concentration decreases, pH increases. So I get basic or alkaline. So what's that? That's going to be my alkalosis. How did I get there? Something wrong with my breathing. There's respiratory alkalosis. So what happens in respiratory alkalosis? Again, you can memorize it or you can reason your way through. My carbon dioxide decreases, shifts my equilibrium, makes hydrogen ion decrease. Hydrogen ion decreases, pH increases. There's my alkaline or basic situation. I got to basic. How did I get there from breathing incorrectly? Okay, let's do another one. Okay, so this time, again, carbon dioxide and hydrogen ions. This time, we're going to tell biochem stories. Biochem stories are always fun. So I'm a little old lady in my rocking chair on my porch, and I really have a rocking chair on my porch, and I'm sure that's too much information. But I saw this commercial, or actually, let's do it this way. My doctor told me that if I want to take, if I want to have a really healthy heart, I need to take a baby aspirin every day. So I want a really healthy little old lady heart. You know, I've got, I've got stuff to do. So I want a really healthy little old lady heart. So what I'm going to do is, is this. Moderation is not my thing. So if one baby aspirin is good, you know, a handful must be better. Some is good, more is better. So I'm going to take a whole bunch of baby aspirin every day. So what is aspirin? Aspirin is actually salicylic acid. Aspirin is salicylic acid. Acid, acid, acid. So I'm ingesting a whole bunch of acid. What's that doing to my hydrogen ion concentration? My hydrogen ion concentration is increasing. Increasing, so my pH is decreasing. 
So there's my alkalosis. And how did I get there? I got there by eating something, eating aspirin. There's my metabolic alkalosis. So I'm going to leave room because we're going to come back and talk about this one in a second. So what causes metabolic alkalosis? A metabolic problem that increases my hydrogen ion concentration, decreasing my pH. So let's do another one. And you can guess what it is. So I was watching an infomercial, me and my little old lady friends, you know, because I have a TV on my porch and everything, and we were out there in our rocking chairs. And we saw that Tums is a good source of calcium. So Tums is a good source of calcium, and Tums actually about 20 plus years ago did advertise themselves this way. And I want really healthy little old lady bones along with having a really healthy little old lady heart. So I'm going to take a whole bunch of Tums too. Well, what's Tums? Well, Tums is basically bicarbonate. So what's it going to do to my hydrogen ion concentration? It's going to decrease it. This is usually when one of you guys say, yeah, you're fine. Take the aspirin and the Tums. You'll balance out. So I decrease my hydrogen ion concentration. What happens to my pH? My pH increases. So there's my alkalosis. My pH is too high. What was my mechanism? My mechanism was metabolic. So I ingested something and that gave me metabolic alkalosis. So let's talk about my metabolic alkalosis here. So I can, I can do something. So we said I can have an equilibrium and change it and go back and forth and all that. So what have I done? I started out in equilibrium. So let's, let's just draw it again. So I started out in equilibrium. I'm, I'm balanced right now the way I wrote it. So then I, I ate my bottle of Tums. That drove my hydrogen ion concentration down. So that drove my hydrogen ion concentration down. So I'm out of equilibrium now. So now what's going to happen? What's going to happen is I'm going to send some carbon dioxide over to replace it driving my carbon dioxide concentration down, making a new equilibrium. So then I'm, I'm in equilibrium again, but I eat more Tums. So down with hydrogen, send carbon dioxide over, it goes down, new equilibrium, more Tums, more, more, more. But how would it be if I compensated for this. So I can regulate, not consciously, but my body regulates how much carbon dioxide I exhale. And it's kind of like this. The carbon dioxide that I exhale is leftovers. So the more I make, the more I have overall, the more I have overall, the more leftovers I have. Or the less I make, the less I have overall, the less leftovers I have. It's kind of like, let's say I was cooking. I don't. I reheat. I don't cook. But let's say I decided to cook. If I want lots of leftovers, what am I going to do? I'm going to cook a lot, make it worth my while. So, you know, cook a huge pan of lasagna to get more leftovers so I can eat it for a week or whatever. If I just cook a little pan, I'm not going to have any leftovers. So how would it be if I want to compensate for this, how would it be if instead of exhaling as much carbon dioxide, I, I kept some in? So if I kept some in, I'm going to have more carbon dioxide. So if I keep, 
keep carbon dioxide is and exhale less carbon dioxide, I can drive this. Let me change colors. What color haven't I used? I can drive this back up. So I have more carbon dioxide to bring over and drive this back up to try to replace those hydrogen ions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep that carbon dioxide, exhale less of it, drive this back up to get a new better equilibrium. I have more carbon dioxide to send over, drive the hydrogen back up for a new better equilibrium, replace some of these hydrogen ions that I was tying up with the bicarb that I'm eating because I'm taking lots of Tums. So what I've done is I've compensated for my metabolic alkalosis by exhaling less carbon dioxide. So I'm keeping it in to replace the hydrogen ions. Then if we look at our, oh, did I mess up here? Yeah, I did. I'm sorry. This should have been acidosis. So I usually do it in the other order. Sorry about that. This video won't be a keeper, but it's just meant to get us through our tech issues. So this was where I was eating all the aspirin. So I'm just eating acid. That sounds pretty gross. So I'm eating acid. So what I did is, because I'm eating acid, I increased my hydrogen ion concentration. So let's look at this. Let's say, let's back up. We'll get rid of that for a second. Focusing on the hydrogen and the carbon dioxide. I start out, I'm in equilibrium. Then I eat a bunch of acid. So I drive my hydrogen ion up. I'm out of equilibrium. I shift my equilibrium towards carbon dioxide, drive my carbon dioxide concentration up, new equilibrium. Eat more acid, shift to CO2, drive it up. So I keep going that way. So now how would it be if I can exhale more carbon dioxide? So now, what I'm going to do, I've got this equilibrium going on here. Now I'm going to exhale extra carbon dioxide. So I'm going to get rid of some. So what's that going to do? That's going to drive carbon dioxide down, allowing me to shift more hydrogen over and bring it down. So getting a new better equilibrium where I brought the hydrogen down by getting carbon dioxide out of there. So that's my compensation, my respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis. So I get more carbon dioxide out, drive CO2 down, which takes the hydrogen ion back down for a new, better equilibrium. So I can have a respiratory compensation for a metabolic problem my respiratory compensation for metabolic acidosis is exhaling more carbon dioxide. My respiratory compensation for metabolic alkalosis is exhaling, exhaling less carbon dioxide, keeping it in to again, give me a new, better equilibrium. I have no way, direct way of having a metabolic compensation for a respiratory problem. So I can have a respiratory compensation for a metabolic problem. I don't have a metabolic compensation, at least a direct one. There's some indirect that Dr. LaRose will do with you. I don't have a metabolic compensation for a respiratory problem. Okay, so that's it for the PowerPoint. The couple other things that we've kind of done, but not done. So we'll talk about it. Next one is we're under protein buffers, we have hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can bind a lot of things. Hemoglobin can bind oxygen. Hemoglobin is an oxygen transporter. Oxygen is not sol very soluble in your blood. 
So we use hemoglobin to transport it. So when you think of hemoglobin binding something, you think of oxygen. Hemoglobin can also bind hydrogen ions and can also bind carbon dioxide ions. Well, let's think about this. I've got my little equation. I've got my hydrogen ions plus bicarbonate. I'm writing it the other way around, switch my left and right just to do it. And think about what we've just been doing. We said that I've got this equilibrium thing going on. Let's say hemoglobin took a bunch of carbon dioxide out of solution. Well, what's going to happen? I'm going to shift my equilibrium towards carbon dioxide, replacing it, driving my hydrogen ion concentration down. Driving my hydrogen ion concentration down is increasing my pH. I've buffered. I've changed my pH. I've buffered. Or hemoglobin grabs onto a bunch of hydrogen ion. Drive my hydrogen ion concentration down, pH up, I've buffered. Or hemoglobin releases a bunch of hydrogen ion, dumps it off in the solution. There's my hydrogen ion concentration going up, going up. Well, what happens when it goes up? pH goes down. I lowered my pH. I buffered. Or hemoglobin dumps off a bunch of carbon dioxide, increases my carbon dioxide concentration, sends my equilibrium towards hydrogen, increasing my hydrogen ion concentration, decreasing my pH, I buffered. So look at it very mechanically, very mechanistically, based on this equation. Carbon dioxide goes up or down, brings hydrogen up or down with it, changes the pH. Hydrogen goes up or down, changes the pH. Or, if you want to make your life difficult, you can dig through all this. Really just saying the same thing we just did. Depending on the equilibrium, and everything is equilibrium based, the hemoglobin can have the carbon dioxide or the hydrogen bound to it, or can release it, depending on the equilibrium. That determines how many hydrogen ions are in solution getting counted, in your pH is the negative log of that molar hydrogen ion concentration. Okay, so the acidosis and alkalosis that we just did. We have some conditions in here that cause acidosis and alkalosis. Those are things that you're going to come to later in the curriculum. So don't worry about them now. I'll tell you in the question you're going to retain carbon dioxide or whatever. But this is to help you connect it. When Dr. Canty gets a hold of you and she's doing bronchitis, respiratory arrest, emphysema, asthma, whatever, she's going to say you retain carbon dioxide and your pH went down. You've got to be able to think back to what we're doing and say, okay, well, I retained carbon dioxide. That shifted my equilibrium towards hydrogen ions, making my hydrogen ion concentration increase my hydrogen ion concentration increased, so that means my pH decreased, I get acidosis. So you've got to be able to connect it when she or other faculty, or when you're reading something, and you're seeing pH change because of carbon dioxide. Well, it's pH, not P carbon dioxide. You've got to be able to make that connection. So you've got to be able to bring this back reason your way through it like we did because if you start memorizing these you're gonna you're gonna mess up respiratory alkalosis again things you're going to talk about later in the curriculum and go back to the equation do the equation that we just did don't try memorizing this stuff it, it's it's unnecessary Metabolic acidosis. Metabolic acidosis it's really really interesting and you're going to hit it more later in in the curriculum here and there. So again, you're going to have to be able to relate back to what we're doing. You're making most often acids in your tissues, metabolic acids, for whatever reason. The reasons can be interesting. One that you're going to hit a lot is diabetes. If I'm diabetic, what are my steps, my processes, my reactions, and we'll do them, that make me make 
more acid. You're actually going to make ketones, and if you make enough of them, be, they become acidic. So you go from ketosis to ketoacidosis. You keep going into ketoacidosis, you go into diabetic shock. So we'll talk about that. We used a really easy example. We did the aspirin. I just wanted you ingesting something acidic. Um, it could be another acidic drug. Chronic diarrhea can cause this. You wash out your, your buffers. Overuse of laxatives. Um, terminally ill patients have issues with it and everything. So you're going to hit all that stuff later in the curriculum. But again, remember the equation. And if you just remember by um, carbonic acids, H2CO3, you can break it out into your hydrogen ion and your bicarb ion or break it out into water and carbon dioxide. And remembering water and carbon dioxide might actually be the easier way to remember the whole thing. Much easier than remembering what goes up, what goes down. Um, I think Dr. Cross talks to you about cosmos breathing. Um, if not, you'll get that later on in the curriculum. Metabolic alkalosis, it's actually pretty rare. Um, typically an overabundance of bicarbonates. That's why I use the Tums example, the antacid. Chronic vomiting, for whatever reason, can cause it because you're losing your stomach acid. So a patient having a lot of issues like chemo patients or anything with nausea, vomiting, they're at risk of it. Overuse of diuretics can be another reason. Again, go back to your equation when you hit all this later in the curriculum. Don't memorize this up-down thing. Okay, and that's it for buffers. Uh, we'll hit it in class also. Like I said, I just wanted you to have this in case we have any more tech issues trying to do it in class.